Let's go to the Bible, John chapter 12, verse 24. Most assuredly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Last week I talked about being in Christ, how God places us in Christ, how God places everything in Christ, not in us directly. We also talked about how God took us out of Adam and through the death of Jesus and the burial of Jesus, He has separated us from the family of Adam to place us into the new race and the family of Jesus. Today I want to speak to you about the other component of the same thing. What does it mean to be, to have Christ in us? Because as a Christian we are in Christ, amen? But also the Bible says that Christ is in us. So what does that mean? How does that apply in our life? This position that I have in Jesus and now Jesus lives in me, how does that work practically? But before we do that, let's start from the beginning. The death of Jesus Christ had three main aspects. The first one we talked about last month is that Jesus paid for our sins through His blood. The second one is that Jesus took our sin, our old man, and crucified it on the cross. So our old man was crucified on the cross, amen? But there's a third aspect and that's what we're going to talk about today and that is on the cross Jesus also gave His life so that this life can be imparted to His followers. Now unlike your life and my life, the life of Jesus is actually the very life of God. The life of Jesus, what in Greek it says zoe, meaning the very life that God has within Him. So on the cross, not only He was paying for my sins, on the cross, not only He was crucifying the old man, but on the cross, He released life that now is available to us. I want you to see this in John chapter 12, Jesus is saying, as a grain of weed goes into the ground and dies. Have you noticed that the grain of weed dying in the ground have, has nothing to do with forgiveness of sins and has nothing to do with the removal of the old man. It has to do, so this is what happens with the grain. The grain has life inside that is protected by the outer shell. Once this grain that has a life inside, if you put the grain of wheat on the table, on the kitchen table, and you keep it there for 10 years, it will not multiply into 10 grains. If you breathe it, if you breathe on it, if you put it in a microwave, it will not multiply. If you put it in a freezer, it will not multiply. Because there is a shell around the grain that protects the life inside of the grain. Jesus Christ carried the life of God, but His flesh was the restriction. It was protecting the life of God. So what had to happen on the cross is the flesh had to be ripped. The death of Jesus Christ, what it did is it released the life that Jesus carried and that life is now available and it could be imparted to His followers and they become meanie grains. We become the sons of God. We become the children of God because Jesus the Son, the begotten Son of God went into the ground and He broke the shell. He broke His body. He ripped His flesh. The veil was rent open so that we can have the life that God had. Hallelujah. The Bible says John chapter 10 verse 10, the thief comes to steal, kill and destroy. But I came to give you life. Now most of us think what that means is this, is that Jesus comes, He heals you and He improves your life a little bit. Most of us, this is what we think, I'm going through loneliness and Jesus comes and He does a remodel to my life. He takes away my loneliness. What Jesus is saying, how does He give us life? By giving His life. But His life couldn't be released until the shell is broken. 
until the flesh is ripped, until the grain goes into the ground and the breaking, the decay that happens until the holy body and the life of Jesus is broken, life couldn't be released. So He doesn't give you life, meaning He improves your bank account, improves your relationship status. He actually releases His life and imparts it into you. Mm. Hallelujah. Jesus died, number one, for my sins, my sin, but also gave His life, ripping His flesh, His flesh being torn life is being released now and that's the parable of the grain dying not to pay for anybody's sins but to release life that is restricted by the shell what does that mean practically to us right now that is how you get Christ in you is because he gave his life the flesh was torn his life was released so that Christ doesn't just live in one place today 2,000 years ago. He is today, He can live in each human being who accepts His sacrifice, forgiveness of sins. And we have Christ living in us because He gave His life. He released that life for us. Amen. The second thing I want to highlight today, I'm just building on a little foundation. Humans are beyond repair and God replaces them with Christ. God doesn't remodel them. Before we talk about receiving Christ's life, I want to tell you why it's important and imperative that you understand God doesn't give life of Jesus to you as an addition to your life. He doesn't give it as a, an add-on. He gives it as a replacement to your actual life. Now in the Bible, it uses this thing about the law. I want you to go with me to book of Romans and chapter 7 verse, verse 14. It says that the law is perfect, spiritual, but I am not. And then in verse 4, it says this, Therefore, my brethren, you have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that you should bear fruit to God. So keep the thought that Jesus died on the cross, not only to pay for my sins, to kill the sin man, the old man, but he also to, re to release his life. Keep that on, on the side. Let's go to this side for just a second. Your ability to meet God's standards, your ability to please God on your own is so flawed. And when I say your ability, myself included, is so broken and is so flawed that it's beyond repair. In fact, the Bible doesn't say that God came in and saw our inability to keep His standards and lowered His standards to our ability to keep it. You know, uh, there was a guy who was uh, teaching uh, basketball to one of his students and the guy just couldn't jump high because he wasn't very tall. And so what he did is he lowered the basketball hoop to the height of the guy who couldn't hit it. So now he was able to come in and just go like this. So that's not what God did. God couldn't lower his standards because God's commandments reflect his nature. And God never changes his nature to cater to you and I. So God's commandments are not bad. It's us who are bad. God, God's commandments are not evil. God's commandments are not the problem. The problem is with us and our inability to jump high enough. And so to meet this problem, God doesn't lower the hoop and nor does God take us to a training booth or to a training booth camp and says, let me teach you to jump higher. See, most of us think like this is that God has these standards you know, love your husband, honor your husband, love your wife, you know, take care of your children, do all of these, these high standards. And then there's, you know, the things of walking in purity, the things of walking in honesty. And these standards are so high and it's so high to keep them. And then we know that God won't lower them because they reflect His nature. But we're so low, we're thinking that all God needs to do is give me a hand to meet those standards. But I want you to notice what Paul is saying. Paul is not saying that because we were not able to meet those standards that God came in and helped us. God came in and killed us. 
So God didn't kill the law. He killed us. So if God in His wisdom didn't think you were worth fixing, improving, renovating. He said, this is such a mess beyond repair. There's only one thing I can do. Burn this to the ground. Guess what this is? Your and my ability to keep God's commandments. And he says, I want to kill you to the law. I died to the law. God doesn't kill the law. He does not remove the law. He kills me to the law. The law is still there. I'm just dead. Now when I am dead, meaning my ability to keep it, my ability to please God through it, my ability to be perfect dies and, and God says, now I can marry you to Jesus. Mm. You can be married to Jesus so you can bear fruit. So it's no longer work for God. It's no longer trying to please God. It's an intimacy, a union with Jesus Christ and out of it comes the fruit that pleases God. What am I saying? God is not in the renovation business. God is in a completed demolition and starting everything from scratch. And guess how He starts things new from you? Not by building you as a new person, by placing His Son to live inside of you and living it right through you. That what it means to have Christ in me. Meaning my ability to please God is not just broken, flawed, it's beyond repair. I will never be able to measure up. I will never be able to be good enough. That's what God thought. Imagine praying, Lord, help me to do better. When God Himself thinks you're beyond repair. Why pray that prayer? It's contradicting God's Word and God's assessment of how actually messed up you are. You're messed up way more than you think. That's why when people sometimes say, you're bad, I say, you don't know how bad. I'm way worse than you think. I'm so bad, God didn't even think to he, I could fi be fixed. God thought the only solution was to kill. Because He says, this thing can't be fixed. If God thought that, my friend, we should get on board. And should give up trying to be good in our own ability. Why did God give us Christ? Why is His life necessary? Because the whatever mechanism you have to live for God is broken beyond repair. That is so freeing. That is so liberating. <sighs> I knew something was wrong with me. I just didn't know it was that bad. <laughs> but now knowing that it was worse than that and that God already has a solution and that is to, to kill me and to say, I don't want you to live. I want my son to live through you. Now, I know some of you are looking at me and you're not convinced yet. So let's go just a little bit deeper. Stop trying and let Jesus live through you. Luke chapter 18 has this story of a young rich ruler and young rich ruler is the goals for every person here. Not only he was righteous, the guy was rich. I mean, come on, let's be honest. A lot of us were like, man, I wouldn't mind having a little bit of money, but I was sure would like to have a lot of money and a lot of morality. Imagine having money and morality. I mean, that's it. That's what it means to be an American successful Christian. You're righteous and God bless your soul. You're rich. And this guy comes to Jesus and he says this, how can I enter the kingdom of God? And Jesus highlights the fact that he has one more thing this guy needs to do. Just one more thing. Not many things, just one thing. This guy has done 99% right. He just needs one more thing. And Jesus highlights that. He says, oh yeah, you just need to do one more thing. I mean, how hard would it be to do that one more thing, right? When you've done everything right in your life and you can finally please God because you've been disciplined, you've been doing good, you've tried your best. Other people are slacking. You are exhibiting effort and a lot of strength to please God. And now the God of universe says just one more thing. There's just only one problem with that one more thing. 
that one more thing is what he could not do. And then disciples come to Jesus scared to death. They said, Jesus, if that is the standard, who can be saved? And I want you to notice what Jesus says. He does not say, oh yeah, if you just try harder. He says, it is impossible. He doesn't say it's hard. He says, it is impossible with man. The meaning, as long as it's you, it's impossible. Now you can get to 90%, maybe 80%, but to be what God wants you to be, Jesus Christ says it's impossible. Why try? Maybe we should stop trying. But see, most of us think it's like, no, Jesus, you don't realize if I only can get my smoking habit under control, I'll get it. And you will have that one thing you'll struggle with for the rest of your life. Until you get to this, to this truth, it is impossible with men. But it is possible with God living on the inside. That's Luke chapter 18. And Jesus demonstrates that in Luke chapter 19. Because in Luke chapter 19, a guy does not come to Jesus to get better. Zacchaeus doesn't come and say, Jesus, how can I get better? Zacchaeus is rotten to the bone. And honestly, he doesn't even want to change. You never see Zacchaeus wanting to change. Zacchaeus wasn't searching how to become a better husband, a better leader, or a better tax collector. Zacchaeus only one thing he wanted, I want to see Jesus. And even at that thing, he was failing because he was too short. Until he climbed on the tree, and I think that's a symbolic of the cross of Jesus. We're all born short of the glory of God, but when you come to the cross and the blood of Jesus washes your sins, and you get crucified, your old man get crucified with Christ, the Bible says that Jesus saw Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus didn't see Jesus, Jesus saw Zacchaeus. My friend, you are not good enough in yourself, but if you come to the cross, if you come to the blood, Jesus will see you. You will have an encounter encounter with Jesus. Somebody give God some praise for the blood. Somebody give God some praise for the cross. I'm sorry, but we're going to get excited in this church today because we've been washed. We've been sanctified. We've been redeemed. Our old man is dead. We have been made new creation in Jesus. And Zacchaeus meets Jesus on the tree. Do you want to meet Jesus? You may say, but I don't want to change. I'm not telling you to change. I'm telling you to meet Jesus. Because when you meet Jesus, everything changes. You can try to change and never meet Jesus. Christianity is not about changing. It's about exchanging your life with His life. It's not about being better. It's about realizing you are so bad, you are dead. But Christ can make you new. Christ can make you alive. Christ can give you life. And Jesus meets Zacchaeus and Jesus asks Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, make haste, watch this, come down from the tree. I must be in your house. Christ in me, watch this. He goes to Zacchaeus' house. We don't see a mention of Zacchaeus' tax, taxes, misdealings, duping people and lying to people. The presence of Jesus in the house of Zacchaeus. Without Jesus saying, Zacchaeus, give money. He tells the rich ruler who is trying to please God to give money and he can't. He walks into a house of a corrupt man. The presence of Jesus causes the man to turn his wallet over and says, half of my income I will donate Whoever I ripped off, I will give four times more. See, this is the difference Jesus in me makes. He produces desires. He lives through me to produce change I can never, ever produce in my own. The Lord doesn't come to help you. He comes to live through you. He doesn't need your help. The only help He wants from you is to stay out of His way. 
the only help he needs from you is to quit trying. Imagine this, if there is a semi truck parked in the parking lot today, how many of you know that for me to lift a semi truck is impossible? But it doesn't mean I cannot not try. How many of you know that me trying to lift a semi truck, I'm going to ruin my back? I can't lift it at all, but the trying actually will hurt me. As long as you keep trying, you keep getting hurt. You can't lift this thing. You can't. It's impossible. You don't need Christ in you if you keep trying. Christianity is about surrender. It's about trust and it's about Christ in me, the hope of glory. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 it says, for I've been crucified with Christ. Remember the death of Jesus crucifies my old man. No longer I. Jesus is not coming to renovate my eye. He's not coming to help my eye. He's not taking my eye to the gym to say, you can learn to jump higher. No longer I, but Christ who lives. He doesn't just, it's not just in me. He lives in me. And the life which I now live, I live through the Son of God. That's incredible. You know, we talk about anytime I mention Christians having demons, it irritates people like crazy. Because of this one phrase, Christians cannot be possessed by a demon. Because that would indicate a demon lives and owns them. And this is how Christians usually say, because a Christian is possessed by Jesus. I've seen possessed people. They look, act, talk funny. Something else takes over their tongue. Something else takes over. You can see it in their eyes. Something else looks through them. You can see it in their behavior. Sometimes they will not even differentiate between them and the spirit that is living through them because it mash, mashed itself so close. But I think a lot of Christians have only claimed to be possessed by Jesus. But in reality, he is deep in the glove box of their theological preferences, but he's not living. Jesus is almost like Paul says, I am in suffering until Christ is formed. Jesus is not living. Is he living your life? Or are you still living yours, asking him to help you live your life? You don't need Christ in you to help you live your life. Christ in you is to live your life and you need to stay out of His way. In this way, Christian life becomes about Jesus, not Jesus about Christian life. Philippians says this, Paul says, for me to live is Christ. Paul didn't say, I live for Christ. He says, I live by Christ. He says, the life that I now live is Christ, meaning Christ lives in me. It's not a theological, just a doctrinal statement. It's a reality. I have someone else living inside. He's living through me. He is speaking through me. He is working through me and He is changing me. I am a Christian. I am in Christ and Christ is in me. Church, are you picking up what I'm laying down? Christian life is not a changed life, it's an exchanged life. There's a world of difference between asking God to help you to be holy and Christ living in you as your holiness. 1 Corinthians 1.30, it says that God placed us in Christ who has become for us our sanctification, wisdom, redemption and righteousness. I wonder how many of us have been deprived of the power of Jesus, the life of Jesus living through us because we're trying too hard, surrendering too little. And the efforts that we put into changing our character, they're so, they produce work. But we're not supposed to produce work, we're supposed to produce fruit. You can't produce fruit if you're working. You can only produce fruit if you're abiding. Abiding in what? Meaning I am in Christ. Christ is in me. Jesus is not my example of how to live. Jesus is how I live. Jesus is the life I live. 
If Jesus is your model of how to live, you will fail miserably like a rich ruler. If Jesus is how you live, you will be like Zacchaeus, changed and surprised by the very change that God is doing in your life. And you will be almost like an observer to the work of Jesus in your life. I'm not saying that there's going to be no cost and no obedience, but a lot of that cost in obedience is letting Him live instead of me trying to get better and get stronger. The overemphasis on self-esteem teaching in the United States cuts Jesus away because it's all about your self being esteemed. Jesus' view is not esteeming your flesh, it's killing it. Jesus' view is not your self-image. That's your problem. That's my problem in the first place. Jesus' solution is this, is you're dead to the law. You're dead to sin so that Jesus can take the place. It's almost like God says, I don't trust you anymore. I can only trust my son. Can you please make room for Jesus? You're like, oh, but I'm too messed up. I'm too weak. Oh, but I can't quit smoking. But you don't understand. I am very mean as a person. Jesus, I have so many problems. Jesus says, I can handle the problem. I'm really good at that if you don't know. What I cannot handle is if you don't give me room to work. He wants to enter in and He wants to live through you. That's what the mystery of Christ in me. When Christ who is our life appears, then you will appear with Him in glory. Colossians chapter 3 verse 4. Victory doesn't come because we got the power to be more like Jesus, but because God gave us Christ to be in the place of us, to live through us. In the conclusion, what does that mean? What, what do I do this week practically? Will I get it so I just don't do nothing? Yeah. Look what, what you're doing has got you. Not very much, it's like a treadmill. You're sweating, kind of like me right now, not going anywhere. Circles, running circles around this pulpit and sweating like crazy. And that's how most of our efforts are. And so what do you do? Instead of saying, Lord, help me to live for you, you just pray this prayer. Lord, I can't do it. Live your life through me. Let's say you're addicted to smoking and you tried quitting. So, so for this week, stop trying. Just absolutely. So, so what if I will, don't worry about what if and what's going to happen tomorrow. This is, this is the attitude. Instead of saying, I'm going to try to quit smoking. You simply say that to the Lord in the beginning of the day. Lord, I can't quit smoking. But you can. So I'm going to let you live through me today. That's all I'm going to do is I'm going to quit trying to quit smoking. And I'm going to just let you live through me. Let's say you're a husband and you're not attentive to your wife. And your wife is always complaining. You forget to tell her that you love her and you forget to hug her and you forget to give her this. And you're not very attentive as a husband when you come from work. You're constantly zooming out, watching uh, television or constantly on your phone. And you're like, yeah, yeah, I'm going to do better. But you keep slipping into the same thing. So what if you do this? What if you stop doing better? And you just tell your wife, say, I'm sorry, I'll never be able to change. Don't worry, she might kick you out actually. You must change. But okay, maybe don't tell it to your wife. Tell it to the Lord. <laughs> tell it to the Lord. Say, Lord, I'm a husband that I just cannot change. It just, just, I just can't change. But Jesus, I yield to you and I, I ask you to live through me and be a good husband through me. Guess what happens? You're transferring all the pressure on the Lord right now. And I can tell you, Jesus can live up for it because He died for that purpose that His life could live through you. And Jesus will finally say, I am finally, finally. Maybe you're like Martha. You're worried and stressed out and you're just so... Martha wasn't trying to cook dope in the kitchen. Martha was making them sandwiches for Jesus. Martha was trying to please Jesus. She was giving things to Jesus. Jesus never ordered, but she thought it would be a nice thing to do. And she's frustrated and she's coming and, and this is the thing. She's like, I just need just a little bit of help. Mary, could you help me? Jesus, could you help me? And this is the thing. When you're trying to live for Jesus in your own ability, you will always feel like if I could just get a little bit. Just God, I'm not asking for a lot, just the 5%. Okay, God, if you can do 5, 1%, please. And you will think Jesus will say, yeah, yes, Martha. I don't even know why are we not helping you Mary. Let's go help Martha. Jesus sits there, completely ignores her plea to help Him. And He says, Martha, 
you got this whole thing wrong. You should quit doing whatever you're doing. The only thing that you need to do is at my feet. If you think God's gonna help you to live better, the only thing He's gonna tell you, stop trying, come be with me, be in my word, surrender to me. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed this content and this was a blessing to you, would you help us and hit thumbs up so that it could help more people to discover this video. It costs you nothing, but it can go a long way to help with the algorithm. As well as if you're not subscribed to our channel, hit subscribe, click on the bell so that you can be reminded each time that we upload videos. Thank you so much for being a part of this community. If you're interested in learning more about Hungry Gen, our internship, our conferences, deliverance and so many other things, go to HungryGen.com for more information. And as always, remember, better is not good enough, the best is yet to come.